So how you know if you are implementing the science of reading is whether or not the work that you are doing, the materials that you're using, the instructional practices that are part of your daily repertoire represent the knowledge we have accrued over the last several decades about the scientific practices that are associated with improved outcomes for students. And how do we know that? We know it because these findings are based on rigorous design. A rigorous design is not an observation, although observations are interesting and can generate hypotheses about rigorous design. They are not the same thing. We know that there are studies that are planfully executed in ways to protect findings from bias or contamination. What that means is that the science of reading is not something a few people decided, but rather a set of studies and their findings confirmed over time in which an unbiased perspective was allowed to determine the result. And it is based on reliable and valid measures, which give us more confidence in these findings, and that studies are implemented in ways that they can be replicated. So the findings are not hidden. The procedures for conducting, conducting the studies are not uh, opaque, but instead they are all transparent in a way that if the study needed to be replicated to assure that the findings would be the same, it could be. And we interpret these findings from studies in this scientific method in ways that are trustworthy. So it is this accumulation of knowledge that undergirds, or if you will, supports the idea of the scientific method supporting the science of reading. Now, most of you may be familiar with what you think of as the big five, which serves as the framework for the science of reading. And when we think about that big five, we think about phonological and phonemic awareness, we think about phonics, we think about fluency, or if you will, reading accurately with appropriate speed and with appropriate prosody or with inflection that suggests that we are reading for meaning. Vocabulary means that, of course, we know what a substantial number of words mean at age and grade appropriate level. And of course, comprehension that we understand and are able to learn from the texts that we read. Now, we describe those as the big five, meaning they are the framework for the science of reading. So you should look for these elements being appropriately represented at grade levels within a program or materials that you are using. And you will notice at the bottom, I have added one, and it says plus spelling and writing. Because what we know about the science of reading is that students become more proficient in word reading and in phonics and phonemic awareness when they utilize writing, and that can come in the form of spelling the words, and it can come in the form of word writing, it can come in the form of phrase writing, and of course, more proficiently, sentence and paragraph and multi-paragraph writing. So the big five is now a big six, which includes spelling and writing. So as I offer this as the foundation for the framework of uh, the science of writing, of uh, reading, please enter comments, questions, and thoughts in the chat box so that we can um, pause later on and address some of them. We also know that the science of reading has established that the explicitness of instruction is the secret sauce associated with beneficial outcomes for students and may just be the most important part of the instruction for success. So what is explicit instruction and how are you sure that you're weaving that through your big six, whether you're teaching phonemic awareness or phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, writing or spelling, how are you making sure explicit instruction is represented? So consider this. Explicit instruction, it's a broad construct, but it represents a set of instructional routines that specify the tasks and behaviors that you would expect from good instruction. For example, clarity. For example, responding to students' needs. For example, a focus on success in ensuring 
not just that the better learners in your class are successful, but that all learners are successful. And this would include opportunities for deliberate practice on those high leverage skills with feedback. And that represents high quality explicit instruction. And so when you're teaching explicitly, we know that students clearly understand what is expected, what are the expectations, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to practice and or express either orally or in writing or through reading what they're learning. We know that when we're teaching explicitly, the instructions are brief and precise. I have an idea for you. I often think that I can determine successful explicit instruction by the number of words the teacher is using. Precise and brief, in other words, often fewer words is associated with more explicit teaching. Extraneous words unnecessarily distract students and keep them from focusing on the high leverage knowledge you are focusing on. So the instruction is focused on the student and guided by the student's learning and responses and adjusted accordingly. When students are getting the ideas quickly, we move faster. When they're having more difficulty, we stop and do reteaching. So this instruction is provided in this structured manner, connected to previous learning, and we model the behavior that we're looking for, maybe even using think alouds to show it. Gradually releasing these learning tasks so that they provide the support with ongoing feedback built upon and revised so that students maintain what they learn, not just learn it initially. So that this sequence of learning tasks is logical with goals and expectations related to the activities and demonstrations clear step by step so that complex tasks are broken down. So now, let me go back and revisit some of these ideas and talk a little bit about how you can break them down for your, um, uh, in, for your instruction in your classroom. 